Now, if you're looking at that airplane flying through space and we represented the sonic boom as this interference between circular waves, you may have been thinking to yourself, but hang on, there are three dimensions. Well, that's true, and in real life, often we have to think about waves in three dimensions. In this course so far, we've really only treated rigorously a one-dimensional case where we have a single spatial axis and propagation in time. But in real life, with three dimensions, we get some pretty horrendous looking differential equations. We're not going to deal with these differential equations in any depth in this course, but I will show you one solution that is for a point source in three dimensions. And this gives us spherically symmetric waves. So it would look like this. We have shells, spheres propagating out from the center. And in this case, we can actually reduce the wave equation back down to a system with one spatial dimension, which is the radius, the distance from the center, and time. So second order time derivative, second order spatial derivative. Uh, and the function we're solving for here is a, and a is a function of r and t. And one possible solution is 1 on r, so it's a wave with an amplitude that decays as the inverse radius as you move away from the center. And this is a cosine function with omega t minus kr and some phase in here. And if we animate these waves, what we have is something like this. We have waves being emitted from this point source, moving away from the point source at the speed of the wave, and the amplitude decays as 1 on r. Now, what about interference between two point sources in three dimensions? What would this look like? Well, this would look like this. Now we have two point sources next to each other, and we see that sometimes these waves overlap and interfere constructively. So along this line here, for example, we see we have some waves propagating, but there are some directions, like along this direction here and along this direction here, where the amplitudes of the waves, uh, when they add up, they interfere to give zero. So this is lines of destructive interference, where we have a zero amplitude, and lines of constructive interference, where we have some amplitude. Now we can make things look a little simpler by just taking a plane, a single plane, through this problem and thinking about things only in two dimensions. So we're just taking a single plane through this three-dimensional problem and looking at the interference in a two-dimensional space, kind of like you've got uh, interference of water waves on the surface of water. That's what we're thinking of now, although we can you know, imagine this is in three-dimensional space as well. So here it is in, in two dimensions, and what we see is we have these lines of constructive interference, like this. And we can ask the question, at what angle do we get constructive interference? What's the condition we require to get constructive interference? So what angles do the waves add up? And we can also ask what angles do the waves cancel out? So what angle do we get destructive interference? Well, let's do a calculation for constructive interference. Now, if we have constructive interference, what it means is that the path from this point source to some point in space over here and the path from this point source to the same point in space, these paths must be equal in length, so the waves arrive in phase, or if they're different in length, they must be different by an integer number of wavelengths, so that when the waves arrive at this point, they interfere and add up constructively. So what we require is that the difference in the distances, r2 minus r1, this is r2 here, r1 here, the difference in these distances must be equal to an integer number of wavelengths. So m is an integer, lambda is the wavelength. That's the condition for constructive interference. And using Pythagoras' theorem, we can very quickly write down what r1 and r2 are. Um, so this is the di distance between the point sources is d, so this distance here is d on 2, and this is d on 2 to the center line here. And so we get, by Pythagoras, r1 is equal to this, and r2 is equal to this. And so what we require then is that m lambda is equal to the integer number of wavelengths is equal to the dis difference in these two distances. Now that's true and it works for anywhere on this, this plane, but it's kind of ugly. We can simplify things a little by assuming that d is small compared to the distance um, that we're looking at away from the sources. So that's the general solution. But when the sources are close together compared to the distance to the observer, this is the observer over here, we can use this expansion of a square root for small a, so that we have 1 plus or minus um, a on 2 is equal to this square root here, for a much, much less than 1. And we can use this simplification, this Taylor expansion, to 
simplify our equation somewhat. So let's start with this hideous looking square root here. So we've got this one here has a plus, and this one here has a minus. So I've sort of joined them together and written them as one with a plus minus here. We can get rid of this d squared on four. We're assuming that this distance here is small compared to all the other distances in the problem. So we can cross that out straight away. Take out a factor of uh, x squared plus y squared square rooted. And then we get one plus or minus xd divided by x squared plus y squared. And we sh this bit here, if d is small, then this is a number which is much, much less than one. And so it looks like this square root here. That's our a in other words. So we can rewrite this entire thing as square root of x squared plus y squared, one plus or minus xd on two times x squared plus y squared. And so this is our expansion of this square root. We substitute this back into the general solution up here. And we find that m lambda, the integer number of wavelengths, has to be approximately equal to this now. The ones here cancel. And in fact, what we find is m lambda is equal to d. And there's an x on square root of x, plus, x squared plus y squared. And this is sine theta. If we look at this angle here, theta, from the center line, then uh, that's given by x, this distance here, uh, divided by the hypotenuse, which is x squared plus y squared. So in fact, what we've got is the diffraction equation that m lambda is equal to d sine theta. And this is an equation you've probably seen before. It's valid only in the case where the distance from the, the point sources is uh, a long way away compared to the distance between the sources. And we call this the diffraction equation. As an example, we can look at this. So we imagine we have two point sources that are separated by three and a half wavelengths, for example. So D is three and a half lambda. This is our diffraction equation. What are the angles of constructive interference? Well, we can say that sine theta must be equal to M lambda on D. We substitute in the uh, value for D here, and we get that sine theta must be M on 3.5, where M is some integer. In other words, theta is arc sine m on 3.5. And then what we do is we go through and find all the values of m such that this gives a real value for the angle. So m could be 0, plus minus 1, plus minus 2, and plus minus 3. And that gives us 0, and then plus minus 16.6, plus minus 34.8, and plus minus 59 degrees. So that's all these angles here. And we call these the diffraction orders. So this would be the zeroth order. This would be the first order, second order, third order. And this direction, the minus first order, minus second order, and minus third order.